We're delighted to kick off this Creation Care initiative that we have been talking about and working at for a, a few months, and Barbara's going to share a little bit more about that just in a minute. But it's exciting to see where this journey takes uh, the church, takes us as individuals, as we uh, think a little bit more about stewardship and care of the earth that God has given to us and our role in that and our responsibility to be good stewards of God's creation. And so we're thrilled to start that journey, start that conversation. And as I say, we're not quite sure where it will lead us um, as a congregation or as individuals, but we are uh, delighted to start that and to explore that together. So let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we do rejoice in the creation that you have given to us, the beauty around us, the ways in which we encounter you as we live and move in our world. And we pray as we begin this journey to think more deeply about our role in caring for your world, we pray that your spirit would move us, that we would be open to your leading. We would discern new ways of being in the world, of taking care of the world, new ways of living and interacting with one another. We pray that you would be here in this room and as we gather today, as we learn from one another, for we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that we're, we're all here together today. Um, just, I wanted to say a few words about the um, the, the backstory to what led us up to today. So, um, the uh, as you hopefully all know, we had, our, our congregation has a really robust small group program. And um, if you haven't gotten involved in a small group, I'm going to put in a plug for it because um, I just have found that it's it, it we the the group that oversees these programs was changed somewhat recently to from education to spiritual development and I think that that's an apt name because I have found that the small group experience has really been fundamental to my spiritual development. So the Tuesday night group, which has been around for a long time, uh, last year decided to read a book called Saving Us, which was on the New York Times bestseller um, by an author who's both a climate scientist and a Christian, and her husband's a pastor, actually. So um, we read this book, and um, we learned a lot from it. And the really, the upshot of the book is the single most important thing that any of us can do to deal with this issue of climate change is just to talk about it. And so she um, provides some tools and methods for doing that. And uh, so the Tuesday night group, after we got finished reading the book, we were like, well, let's keep talking about it. So um, over the summer, there was a, a, a group of us uh, who, and I see folks in the room, Rogers here, and Carol Skidmore, Tom and Peggy Eicher, Ellen Greenhorn, Rob Brown is here somewhere. If I'm missing anybody else who is part of the, the interest group, raise your hand. But, um, oh, Elaine is there. I mean, Evelyn is there. Um, and uh, um, so we started brainstorming ideas about what were some things that we could do as a congregation and um, came up with a plan. And, and Session has uh, formalized this group as a task force to roll out this exploration of creation care. And um, Tom and Peggy and Ellen and Rob are part of the task force with me. And so we're, we're looking at the next several months as an opportunity to share some programs with the congregation and hopefully have it become part of the life of the church. So, um, so the, the, the focus of this program really over the next several months is we're going to be uh, exploring the question how are we how are we called as people of faith as seekers as humanity uh, in its entirety called to care for God's creation um, so we're going to explore this with uh, various programs there are going to be some that are more lecture format like this some are, are a little more hands-on uh, this spring the um, youth groups are going to participate in a stream cleanup with the Raritan Headwaters Association as a real hands-on activity. 
Um, Worship and Music is planning a creation care service for later in the spring. Uh, what else have we got going on? Um, it, it, as I said, this kind of has, has its roots in spiritual development, and so Spiritual Development Council is uh, supporting this program. I know, Roger, I heard you were at the Presbytery meeting recently, uh, letting them know about this program that's going on here. And, um, and we're also looking to work with uh, Spiritual Development to actually add some new volumes to our library, including things like Saving Us and some other um, books that deal with this with this topic. So um, so one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do, if you didn't already uh, go online and sign up for this event, to, to just go back in and do that. And that will get your name on our mailing list, because we will try to uh, disseminate some information even, even in between the programs and, and hopefully carry on some dialogue there. So you just go to the events page um, and you do that. So um, to get us started, I wanted to share, uh, um, oh, yes? There's something on the screen there. Oh, got it. <laughs> um, to get us started, I have a, a short video clip that we got from a, um, a group out in California that has provided us with some resources. And um, I just wanted to give you a little background into who, who, who you're about to see talk. So the, the first speaker is Bishop Michael Curry, who's the presiding uh, bishop of the Episcopal Church. And the second piece in this video is about the Laudato Si. You may remember hearing about that back in 2015. Uh, the Pope who named himself after St. Francis of Assisi wrote uh, a, a landmark um, letter about how we can uh, take care of our, uh, you know, uh, his, the title of it is On Care Up for Our Common Home. And well, Papal letters are often addressed to the you know bishops and the the community of the faithful. This one was actually addressed to everyone, to all of humanity. Um, and the Pope said, "I urgently appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet." And then the third speaker we're going to see in the video actually is the author of this book, Catherine Hayhoe. Um, and uh, so you'll get some insights into, uh, into what this book is about. So, let's start talking. All of God's creation is a part of the very family of God, the entire created world and universe. We see the beauty and the majesty that God has created. We have been charged with being caretakers of God's creation and in so doing to be co-workers with God in the saving work of restoration and reconciliation. If you don't believe me, read Genesis 1. The work we do for the healing of creation is simply joining in God's saving work. This is not secular do-goodism. This is the Jesus movement. As followers of Jesus, we care for God's world because God cares for God's world. God's work goes on. Our world must go forward too. This is God's world. We are God's children, and He's got the whole world in His hands. May God bless our hands as we strive to be faithful in this holy and important work. Pope Francis has written a letter addressed to every person on this planet, urging us all to protect the Earth, our common home. In the letter, he says, The Earth is God's gift to us, full of beauty and wonder, where the fruits of the Earth belong to everyone. But what we see today is that our common home has never been so hurt and mistreated as it has been in the last 200 years. We have developed at a greater speed than we could ever have imagined. We have treated the Earth like it has an unlimited supply of resources, taking more than our fair share from most people on the planet, as well as future generations to come. 
We have stripped the earth of its natural forests, contaminated the earth's waters, its land and its air. Plants and species are becoming extinct at an alarming rate. The earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. Our increasing use of polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, oil and gas, is helping to drive climate change, which is one of the biggest challenges we face today. Climate change affects us all, but it is the poorest communities who suffer the most. The whole human family needs to work together so that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Our use of polluting fossil fuels also needs to be replaced without delay. And we need to stop treating the world's resources as an object for profit, with no thought on how our actions might affect the environment or future generations. So let's put love for the world and love for our neighbour into action. Let's undergo an eco-conversion in which we listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. This means taking seriously things like avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water waste, separating rubbish, and using public transport as a part of our calling to protect creation. But more urgently, we need to slow down on how much we consume and throw away. We can find great joy and freedom in living simply, rather than always on the lookout for what we do not have. We are capable of these changes and making a new start. So let us make that start today. Signed, Pope Francis. Laudato Si, a letter from Pope Francis on care for our common home. one on this list that I want to talk about is the one that is nearest and dearest to my heart and it's the topic of tonight. It's the idea that our faith or God or our spirituality gives us hope. Well, people might say, but, but why do you need that? We have the science and we absolutely do. What the science does is it can tell us. It can tell us what is happening to our world. It can tell us the new records that are being broken whether for global temperature, Greenland ice melt, hurricane intensification, heavy rainfall, or devastating heat waves. And it can document not only how climate is changing, but why. For the first time ever, humans are responsible. And we can go even further. We can quantify the implications of our choices. So we can say, if we choose to do this, here's what's going to happen. If we make this other choice, here's what's going to happen. Science can do this. But science cannot tell us the right decision to make. That is where what's in our heart comes into the equation, our values. And for those of us who fall into that 50% or 70% category, a lot of our values are informed by our faith. There's a wide range of views on this home that we inhabit that range from worshiping it to treating it like garbage. But we most, most of us instinctively feel that we fall in the middle. <laughs> we don't really fall at either extreme. And we understand that without the air that we breathe, without the water that we drink, without the food that we eat, without the safe places that we live that are provided by this planet, we would not be here. We are designed to live on this planet. It supplies the beauty of nature as well that feeds our souls, not just our bodies. And as Christians, we believe that the Bible says God made human beings in his image for a reason. That reason being to be responsible for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Rather than being given a piece of land and letting it decay and extracting every piece of value that we can from it, we believe that we are to be caretakers, to be gardeners, to be stewards, to have responsibility. And this is where the whole concept of creation care comes from. But this concept is still incomplete because we are living things too. And when we look at the impacts of a changing climate and who is most vulnerable to those impacts, 
we see that the people who are most vulnerable are the ones who have done the least to contribute to the problem. The people who are already hungry, the people who already do not have clean water to drink, the people who are already dying from diseases that nobody should be dying from. Climate change is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. It's the hole in the bucket. It is not just an environmental issue. It is not just a science issue. Climate change is a health issue. It's an economic issue. It's a poverty issue, a hunger issue, a justice issue. It's an everything issue, and it connects directly to what we believe. As they say in Texas, where they print the Bible on road signs, that love thy neighbor thing, I meant it, signed God. So why do we care? The reason we care about this is because of who we already are. Who are you? Are you a parent, a sister, a brother, a child? Are you a scientist, an advocate, a person of faith? Are you a hiker, a birder, a Rotarian? Who are you? Whoever you are, you're the perfect person to care. And the reason you care about climate change is because of who you are. So who I am then in turn informs not only why I care, but it informs what I think I should do about it. And that again is where our head meets our heart. So as a Christian, the verse that means the most to me about what we're supposed to do about it is this one. It comes from the book of Timothy, where the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. When we hear people talk about climate change these days, fear is the overriding emotion. Fear that ending our use of fossil fuels will devastate the economy and ruin our lives. Fear that if we don't, it will devastate the economy and ruin our lives. Fear of this person getting control or that person doing that. Fear is what drives so much of our conversation today. But we're told, we're given a litmus test, that the spirit of fear is not how we're supposed to operate. We're supposed to operate with three amazing things. A spirit of power. What is power? Power is the ability to act, not be paralyzed by fear, but the ability to be empowered to act. How? Out of love and compassion for others and, as a scientist, this is my favorite part, with a sound mind to make good decisions based on facts and data. So what gives me hope? Everything on this list gives me hope, but if I had to pick one, it's the thing that is nearest and dearest to my heart, and that is the fact that I am a person of faith. And my attitudes towards my child and other children, my attitudes towards my fellow advocates and organizations, technology, innovation, and education, all comes from that same foundation of being responsible and caring for others. So how do we spread this hope? How do we spread it is right there. It's the next thing on the list by talking about it. When they asked me to do a TED Talk that was released a year ago this week, they said, what do you want to do it on? They said, I want to do it on the most important thing we can do about climate change. And they said, well, we already have TED Talks on light bulbs. I said, no, <laughs> I want to do it about talking. How does talking give us hope? Not talking about all the depressing science, talking about why it matters to us in the places where we live and what we can do to fix it. Because when I asked you what gives us hope, what was the common denominator in your answer? People. How do we engage with people? By talking by engaging with each other as human beings, by looking at each other eye to eye, by rejoicing in what we share, by respecting what we differ on, by talking together about how we could head into that better future, that is where we find our hope. And for me, hope is a bit of a reverse emotion. Because to end with one final verse that means a lot to me personally, again from the book of Romans, it says, hope comes from somewhere that we don't intuitively expect. Suffering begins with suffering. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And the hope does not disappoint, as other, other verses say. The hope does not disappoint because of why? Because of love. 
So no matter who we are, no matter what we believe, the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. And I want to conclude with one story of a colleague who um, sought me out for lunch at a scientific meeting a few years ago. I wasn't working with him at the time. I knew him, but I was a little bit puzzled as to why he wanted to have lunch, and he didn't tell me why. So we sat down at the table together, and before I had even hardly sat down, he leaned across the table and he said, I'm a humanist, but I care too. And I said, well, of course you do. He said, I care about people. The reason I do climate science is because it affects people. And it disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, and that is not fair. And so that is why I do the work I do, and that is why I'm so concerned about climate solutions as well, because I care about people. And I said, yes, that's the reason we all care. And we all care because of who we are. Who we are does not have to be the same. Our differences are what make us strong. So whoever you are, whatever you believe in, the only thing that counts is when what you believe in expresses itself through love, and that is the path forward to hope, and that is the path to fixing this thing. Thank you. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that I felt in, in taking on this this project is that this is an overwhelming topic. You know, it's where do you even begin? And um, but I think uh, there's a there's a saying out there that about small changes over time can make a big difference. And I think mm -hmm. that um, that that's part of what we're going to be trying to explore during this series. Or what are the small changes? What are the choices we can make in our lives that will make a big difference? And I, you know. I take hope from the fact that during COVID, there was a measurable decline in uh, carbon dioxide emissions just because we weren't driving for those many months. So, so it is possible. Um, and and uh, I do love that um, passage from Second Timothy that um, Catherine Hayo lifted up, which is, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So let's proceed with, with those gifts in hand. So today we are uh, gathered here to um, be blessed by the presence and wisdom of uh, our keynote speaker. Um, Dr. Kearns is a professor of ecology, society, and religion at True Theological School. She has taught at the Theological School and Drew University since 1994 and has helped eco justice become uh, rooted in the Drew curriculum so that there's now a required course called Global Faiths and the Earth. Her, re her research is focused on religious involvement in ecological issues and movements with a particular interest in environmental justice climate change, and food. She's a co-editor and contributor to numerous chapters and numerous publications, such as creation, uh, Quakers, Creation, Care, and Sustainability, and uh, the Bloomsbury Handbook on Religion and Nature. She uh, is a co-founder of the Green Seminary Initiative. Oh, <laughs> Oh, I had some visuals, but <laughs> um, uh, and uh, her decades-long in, uh, involvement in religious environmentalism has roots in the island where she was born, Sanibel, Florida, which, like many islands, has recently uh, suffered significant impact from climate change. So we are incredibly honored uh, to have with us today to launch our Creation Care conversation uh, with a discussion on conspiring together. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Welker? I'm thrilled to be here, um, and particularly this congregation, because you have a deep history in this work. I was just confirming with your uh, ministers that somebody who helped found the international organization Green Faith was a member of this congregation. So when I moved here in 94, I met Muriel Ryder. Mm -hmm. um, and learn from her, and um, so I owe gratitude to your congregation for nurturing her, and I hope you remember those deep roots. 
Is this going to be my? Um, I don't yeah. think so. I think you'll just have to. Um, okay. If you just hit the thing right there. So I want, I want you to join me in an opening here. I just want you to take a deep breath. Now this time, listen. Our Jewish siblings teach us that breathing is saying the name of God. And so that with each breath, we are offering a prayer. And so I invite you when you're out taking a walk in this beautiful area you live in, even just try five of those deep breathing prayers. And remember that that air that we breathe is a gift from God. Now here is how Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Was Arthur Wasco, who is down in Philadelphia, talks about it. And he reminds us that what we breathe in is what the trees breathe out. The trees breathe in what we breathe out. Breath of life is our God. What unites all the very forces creating all worlds into oneness. Though each breath is unique, all are unified. So I like to call that deep breathing an inner species ritual of communion. Because that's what we've just done. We depend on the trees and the algae and the grasses to produce the oxygen that we have there. And in return, we breathe out the carbon dioxide they, they need. Now, there's a basic lesson there. We can't breathe without each other. And so the more trees we cut down, the more asphalt and concrete, we are reducing our breath mates who actually help keep the air clean. And as we know, they pull down that excess carbon dioxide. So I didn't include it here, I don't think. No, but there are pictures of the planet breathing. And in the winter months, like right now, when we don't have any leaves out, you can see the greenhouse gases accumulating here in the North here in hemisphere. And it's a bright, bright red. But as we move into the summer and the leaves are all out, you can see how much those greenhouse gases diminish. And so our planet is having trouble clearing its lungs. That's one way to think about it. But Barbara asked me to do some theological work with you. And even though I'm trained as a sociologist, I have worked in religion and ecology at a seminary for so long that I do a lot of Bible and theology. So I hope what I have to offer is a little bit of help. And you've already seen the first place I'm going to start. And that is with air. The very beginning of Genesis 1, you may remember, talks about God's spirit hovering over the deep. But the word is ruach. And actually translating in a spirit has been a big problem in the development of our religious thinking about it. Because with Ted Heber, who's a very well-respected um, biblical scholar, I use his work a lot, he points out that it actually is more commonly used as breath. And so when we get to Genesis 2, and I might remind you, Genesis 2 is that wonderful story of God creating the human creature, Adam, out of Adama, the earthling out of earth, the human out of humus. But what makes that earth creature and other creatures live is that God needs the breath of life into them. And if we keep looking throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we see that term breath of life ruach time and time again. And you may remember the story of Ezekiel and the valley of the dry bones that Ezekiel prays and God brings them back to life with the breath of God. 
But you also probably know the Noah story pretty well. You read it to your kids, your grandkids, your um, neighborhood kids. But what a lot of people forget is that the Noah covenant is not just with humans. It is with all living creatures. And actually the wording is all creatures who breathe the breath of God. And one of the interesting things to note there is that humans and creatures are referred to with the same term. So one of the things that happens in the Hebrew scriptures is that the English translations we've inherited from King James call humans and creatures something different when the Hebrew term is usually the same. We are, and we've got that, that we've got that. We are all creatures of creation. So I like to ask my students, is not pollution then defiling the breath of God? Is not pollution a form of sacrilege, of desecration? If it is what we most depend on, is the ability to breathe clean air, what does it mean when our actions make it so our neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself, breathes dirty air? The really sad statistic is we already know that over 6 million people globally die prematurely from respiratory problems each year. And believe me, in New Jersey, more people die from early respiratory deaths than from gunshots. And that never, never makes a difference. All of New Jersey is out of compliance with the Clean Air Act. And it's not all our fault. A lot of it is the coal produced electricity that's coming out of the Midwest but we also have more cars per square inch, per square foot, per square mile, whatever, than any other place in the nation. Mm -hmm. And as we know, that pollution, especially when we're idling, you know, forever, trying to get over the, through the tunnel, over the bridge, trying to come out 78 at the wrong time of day when it merges out there, um, we know that that is the worst polluting air. So when people want to talk about hybrid cars or electric cars, that's a huge factor. They, when they idle, they are not producing. So when a car engine is idling, it's the worst mix of, of air pollution. But the other thing is that our bad sources are our gas-powered lawnmowers, our gas-powered leaf blowers. All of those are very inefficient engines that create air pollution. The sad thing is in Newark and Camden, one in four kids have asthma. My son has asthma. And if you know what asthma does, one thing is the medication that kids are on makes it hyper and aggressive. They have an asthma attack and they go to get medicine. They often come back, packed up in school and they are suspended. They miss more school. They've already missed school from asthma. And you get a picture of how in our urban areas with the worst air pollution, that's a cycle that leads to kids not getting a good education. But I wasn't going to go there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to go anywhere, it seems. <laughs> so the other, as we're sort of on a little bit of a Bible course here, um, what we notice in this passage from Isaiah, and you can probably think of all of the Psalms like 108, where all of creation sings praises to God. You might remember a language like the rocks cry out, the trees clap with joy. We, that language is there constantly throughout those beautiful Psalms. It's there in Job, it's there in the Genesis passages. And what that reminds us is maybe the most important theological thing I can give you. Creation has a relationship to God that is independent of us. Creation sings praises to God. We have a relationship to God 
And therefore, to make it a pretty strong triangle, we need to have a better relationship with our fellow creatures. Rabbi, I learned a lot from working with rabbis over the years here at Drew. And Rabbi once pointed out something that I think I have. Um, Pope Francis putting out a few, few slides. <laughs> I put this together in a different way than I normally do this talk, but that means when a species goes extinct, that a member of God's choir has been silenced. Mm -hmm. And what it also means is that we are the uncreators. We are uncreating the creation by our actions <laughs> and in an alarming point. So I hope that's given you just a few theological nuggets already to start out with. And in this talk, I'm going to assume that you care about the earth, that you connect that care in some ways to your spirituality or faith community, that you read multiple news sources, you're aware of climate change is happening, species extinctions are escalating, deforestation leads to more climate stability, and you find this list depressing, and I know I wouldn't be here if you didn't want to do something. But that is not how to start a presentation. And that's what Dr. Hayhoe was also telling us. The science, the gloom and doom is not convincing enough people to act. Not act with the urgency. Not act beyond our immediate self. And as she points out, not talk to others about it. Because we know it's a political issue, it's a debated, it's not a debated scientific issue, but it's presented as a debated scientific issue. And we're afraid to go into those waters because we don't think we know the science well enough. And maybe we don't want to get into the politics. But notice that no one was ever changed by a pie chart. They are changed by our stories of why we care. So, start with a story. And my story is that I grew up on an island um, that I've known for a long time. Its highest point is eight feet above sea level. And sure enough, with Hurricane Ian, um, about 10 to 15 feet of water went over the island. Most of the structures I grew up with, which would be the older ones, certainly the new, more concrete ones <coughs> were coming in, they are just gone. Absolutely no trace. Maybe you might see one of the cottages move down. And I just learned over the weekend from my stepsister that I thought the place, the condominiums that replaced what I, the place I grew up with, they tore them down and put up concrete things. Even those are gone. There is little I recognize. So what has motivated me all of these years is what I know will happen to that island. I just didn't think it would happen so soon. And what does that tell us? That we keep putting off, thinking there's more time. And for places all across the globe, for peoples all across the globe, the time is already now. But the other reason I do this work is that as an evangelical Christian, I was convinced that my deep love of the island, and if anyone's ever been there, it's a burning haven. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it is a really special place, but don't go there because it's not open to visitors yet. <laughs> but that, that was God's creation, and that, that I had a duty to protect it. But when I told my evangelical youth group I was going to go to college and study science, I was put on the um, their list. <laughs> Does anyone know what that means? It means you're in trouble. <laughs> It'd be nice if you meant, you know, there are good reasons to put people on their list, but it was not good. And this is why. This is um, an extreme statement, but still, this is Ann Coulter. The core of the Judeo Christian tradition says that we are utterly and distinctly apart from other species. We have dominion over the plants and the animals and the earth, and God gave it to us. It's ours to do what we want. 
liberals would sooner trust the stewardship of Shetland ponies and dumb wheels. I always wonder how she picked those two. <laughs> but it is an interesting, maybe insight to her mind. <laughs> One of their pseudoscience supports an alternative religion that says we are an insignificant part of nature. Environmentalist, I want to introduce myself to you right now. Apparently, we want mass infanticide, zero population growth, reduced standards of living, and is the last the worst? <laughs> the core of environmentalism is that they hate mankind. Hmm. Now, that may mean seem like an extreme version of it, and certainly it wasn't the version I encountered, but I did encounter that one should not study science as a Christian. And I did encounter that all of it was here for us to put to good use. It's actually why I don't use the term stewardship anymore. Because stewardship still involves that notion that it's here. It should involve the notion that it's here for us to take care of. But there are many, many conservative Christians who would say stewardship is that God put things here for our wise use. Including buried all those minerals and fossil fuels in the ground because they are gifts to us. And if we don't go looking for them, drilling and mining, cutting down trees, then we are not using God's gifts. We are being ungrateful. Well, I was sure they were wrong. And you know how teenagers, thankfully, can be that way occasionally. <laughs> And I went to a Christian bookstore and I found a book by um, a person that many people consider the father of the Christian right. Um, but on this one, he said, the hippies have it right and we have it wrong. It's called Pollution and the Death of Man. So gratefully, I went on to study science. And then I started to realize I need to study those religious attitudes that keep justifying why we make such bad decisions. And so the other reason I do this work then is because of future generations. Because of trying to think out the change that has happened in my life. I was raised on conservationism on that island. And thank goodness for all the conservationists here in this area that set aside so much on that island. But I just think of all that I've seen change. And I think and I project it into the next generation. So I do it because of my love of place, my love of God, my love of future generations. But the thing I now know is exactly how wrong those books, books were because they thought that if I saw God in creation, I was worshiping creation. Have you heard that? I was pagan in some ways. I was like, I didn't even know what pagan meant. Um, so I'm now at a Methodist institution and I was joyful when in graduate school, I discovered this quote by John Wesley. And I love to read it because it really makes you stop and think. God is in all things. We can agree with that. We might not think about that way, but look what it goes on to say. We are to see the creator in the face of every creature that we should use and look upon nothing as separate from God. For indeed, that is a kind of practical atheism. To not see God's presence suffused throughout the world and in every creature and being is to not really believe in God. Now, that's the opposite from the message I was getting. I was being told that to see God was in creation was somehow not Christian. So I just bring this to you in case it ever comes up because my students tell me that still comes up a lot. And so just, I'm sorry, I don't have John Calvin quotes here. Um, okay. Martin Luther, um, the, you know, as you know, one of the originators of that movie, was filled with this. Augustine was filled with this, Aquinas. God writes the gospel, not in the Bible alone, but also on trees and in flowers and clouds and stars. The idea was the book of nature was the first revelation of God. The Bible was the second revelation. 
And so we have all of these theologians constantly reminding us throughout the tradition how God is present in even the tiniest grain of us. But since I didn't have Calvin quotes to hand in right away, I did want to reassure you Presbyterians make a big difference. <laughs> and one of the interesting things, I would highly recommend this book, Inherit the Holy Mountain, because what Stoll looks into is how the Presbyterians were in the beginnings of the conservation movement in the Hudson School, which is, you know, this sort of incredible grandeur of landscape. So it's a book about how much this is rooted in Presbyterianism. And so I thought some of you might have some extra reading time, and I really loved it. But also, this is um, Lynn White Jr. And Lynn White, a historian of science, wrote a very influential article in the 60s that said that Christianity bore a huge burden of guilt for the ecological crisis because of how Christians had come to view the world. Notice I've given you plenty of evidence that Christians haven't always viewed the world as somehow separate, but that White particularly saw that nature has no reason for existence except to serve humans was a big part of the problem. And so I've just already given you a glimpse of how prevalent that is. And the people I'm quoting have a lot of money and have done a lot of work sending out materials, DVDs that portray environmentalism as, you know, the Antichrist, the next threat. We want world power. It's, it's really pretty disturbing. So one of my uh, clues to you is don't call yourself an environmentalist. It's really sad. But the word environmentalist has been so poisoned with this kind of, of counter um, work. And I've spent my life studying it, but there's lots of other ways to start. So I just, this, I'm not gonna read this whole prayer. It's an incredible prayer. It was written in 1914. Mm -hmm. So people that tell you that this is a new movement, I've already shown you how the care of creation is rooted throughout the Christian tradition back into the plenty of evidence in the Hebrew scriptures and the Jewish traditions. But this also is a wonderful prayer. There have been plenty of our forebears who have already been worried about what has happened. They have tried to sound the alarm. So Walter Rauschenbusch was one of the major theologians. He was Baptist um, for the social gospel. And now, one of the greatest resources we have is, in some ways, this encyclical from Pope Francis. And you've already heard some about it. But what struck me is that they didn't really give the theological reasoning in that clip. They gave the diagnosis of the problem. But I find Francis extremely helpful in thinking theologically, reminding. So here he says, the sister cries out to us because of the harm we've inflicted on her. So notice he's already using this personal sort of related language. He threw out this encyclical or remind us that it's a relationship between God, creation, and humans. And then if you pull any of that out of whack, all of those relations, he will say, we cannot have a good relationship. The violence present in our hearts wounded by sin is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness as evident. So Francis, the head of the ecumenical patriarch of the Orthodox churches, many of our own leaders remind us that actually what we're doing is sin. It is a sin against God, but it's certainly counter to Jesus' commandment to love your neighbor. As God loves you, or love your neighbor as yourself. There's two versions of love your neighbor. Here he's saying that we also can never think of ecology as separate from sociology. Now you know why I have that grandiose title, ecology, society, and religion. Sort of three different ways of seeing the world, and all of them have got to work together 
to get us out of this mess. Here is a sort of different way of the Evangelical Viral Network, founded in, I think, about 91. They are a, a rich resource of working on this in more biblical language, perhaps. But they say that every child born and yet to be born deserves the promise of holy covenant of clean air and a healthy climate. Now, I take a big clue from them and from the Black church and all sorts of folks that one of the most effective ways to talk about it is how you are starting to talk about it food. Talk about our health. These are health issues. What we know is that the people during COVID who lived in urban environments where the air pollution was worse, where there's greater particulate matter, died at a higher rate because their lungs were already compromised. And that's the same situation that I talked about the early deaths of respiratory illnesses. Our air pollution is choking us. <laughs> so here is a quote from Jim Onthal, and he's sort of challenging us. What if we took responsibility to human generations yet unborn? What if we took seriously our moral responsibility? And that's what Hey Ho and our religious leaders are trying to remind us. This is a moral issue. It's not going to be fixed with science and technology unless we look at our values, what we value, and how we act on them. So I applaud Dr. Hey Ho for saying that we've got to talk. But I want to remind you that actions speak louder than. And anyone who's ever been a teacher knows that your students will catch you the first moment they can if they think you're acting differently than what you're teaching. And so they love to get a picture of me saying with a disposable water bottle <laughs> because I talk to them about even get a reusable water bottle. So part of it is I was trying to start to suggest. Part of the problem may be in how we have wrongly interpreted the Genesis message. Because probably Genesis 1, you learned it, humans were created last in God's image, and we're seen as the peak of the pyramid. We actually were the last to be created because we couldn't survive without everything else. It's a pretty clear message. So just imagine if I were to take out one of those bottom layers, say that's the earth and the land. We wouldn't be able to exist. One of my rabbi friends, there's a teaching within Judaism that God thought it was more important to create a gnat before a human, because when is the last thing on your list the most important? <laughs> so we can't exist without the rest of it. Here is Genesis 2, which is a different model of creation. In it, we have that Adam, the earth creature, who then becomes Adam and Eve. And the first helpmates that God creates, if you might remember, it's not Eve. And I always want to call her the helpmate, not the derivative. Um, the first helpmates are other animals. So the message there is that humans need other animals to survive. And then the language goes, and that was not sufficient. And so Eve was created. But the same message we get here is that all of the plants and the other animals needed to exist in order for humans to survive. So the notion that somehow we are at the top and we can do whatever we want to with the rest of creation is completely unbiblical. So theologically, this is part of the problem with that hierarchical model that has humans at the top. Because it already looks down at animals as not as valuable as us. So that's why, you know, there's been a, a long teaching in the Christian tradition that animals don't have souls. And anyone I know who lives with an animal 
will challenge that. And that notion went into hand, animals don't think and don't feel. And so we have tons of research done on live animals. From humans. Now, no one I know who's ever lived with an animal would agree that they don't think and feel either. So that's part of the problem with already saying we're more godlike. It lowers everybody else down. But within that way that tradition was interpreted is that since Adam was created first, men are more important. And I just have to point back to say our constitution, who was allowed to vote? <laughs> who is allowed to own property. So we don't have to look very far to see that within humanity, there are hierarchies of value. And there's plenty in the news today to talk about that because we know that race and gender and class and sexuality all go into those sort of like, who's, who's the most important or who deserves a certain set of things. So I'm not going to go too far on that, but to say that one of the clues I teach my students to look at is who is described at animal times. Because whoever is described as bestial, as animal-like, they're going to be lesser valued because. And so that then points it back that we think of animals as having negative attributes. Well, maybe I've done too much theology. But here, this is what I was saying about Pope Francis and the three relations. And I'll skip all these long quotes, but Francis constantly reminds us, the earth was here before us and it has been given to us. And we are to till and keep it, not to exploit, to ravish it. And so Francis is pretty pointed about another part of the problem. And that is if a tree doesn't have value until it's cut down, then our market modification of everything is part of the problem. And right now the bizarre thing is that as species go more extinct, more rare, they have, they bring a higher price. There are people willing to pay incredible amounts of money to eat a rare fish or to kill a rare game animal. So part of it is that our money system has become the source of most of our values, even though we would say it shouldn't. <laughs> Last thing about the problem. When I tell the story of why I care, this image that came about, most of the people in this room, I think, were probably born before this image came into existence. Because it came into existence, those first space flights in the late 50s, early 60s. That image shaped my life because that's the pale blue dot. The fragility, that is how we are all interconnected. The pollution knows no bounds, and the storm and weather patterns know no bounds. But we tend to live as if this is the view of the Earth. And that is, of course, the difference between interconnectedness, and this is a country invited up by the United <clears throat> States. I don't know how we get over that one. But all the climate agreements, all of the work at the international level is that we've got to be able to see this view. Because it won't matter which side of a border we live on. Climate change, air pollution doesn't really respect class, even if some people bear more food. It doesn't respect that I'm an American and somebody else is a Kenyan. We know those in Africa are already paying a huge price. But there are plenty of people in this country who are paying a price to pay too. So, part of it is that we tiptoe around the issue because it's sort of a way to deny that it's as pressing as it is. 
And so while I pointed out to some outright deniers or skeptics about climate change, and I'm sure you've encountered them, everyone I talked to has somebody in their family. What's worse may be this implicatory denial that we just won't talk about it. Because talking about it reminds us that we do have to do something. So there are plenty of places to start. And one of them might be creating your own environmental identity. What makes you care? I gave you a sense of this is a model that's sort of on a tree, and I thought a tree was a good image for this particular congregation. And that is, what are the roots of your care? How has it branched out? What do you do to keep alive that love for creation? Because one thing we know is you don't mourn something you don't value first. So if we don't care what happens to the forest, to the air, then we're going to be just as happy that another shopping center has gone in and it's a little bit closer. So I talked to you about this, the um, health. And so I'm going to leave you with one last thing. It is really tempting to just work on this in the individual level. And believe me, there are larger forces, corporations, even governments that are quite happy if we think it's all based on what we do. What an institution does, a school system, a county, a municipality, a corporation, their impact is multiplied. So don't, please don't stop with just what you can do in your lives. Pay attention. Right now, we need municipalities in New Jersey to be thinking of what 50 years looks like. Because climate change, waters rising are going to hit this state pretty hard. But if all of the decisions are being made, say a major boiler system has to be replaced in the school, if it's replaced with gas, and that just furthers our dependence on making sure natural gas gets to us. If we aren't building new parts of a school to be more energy efficient, then we're just building in a high demand that probably goes about 50 years. So be active at every level of government because that's where decisions get made that lock in things for longer time. Now, please do something at the individual level. Actions speak louder than words. And I'll stop there so that we can have um, questions and conversation and um, challenges, whatever. I think I will. I think there are some time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just on that, the note of the, the blue, <clears throat> you know, the, the small blue dot, I heard um, Neil deGrasse Tyson defending the idea of you know, this uh, tourist business of taking people up in spacecraft, you know, with, with uh, you know, rockets to see right. the earth in that radio. It's such an elitist thing. Right. But then his argument was no, everybody should go up there. And look back at the earth and see that image in real life. Yeah. I that image I carry with me. I swear to God, this this is the big picture. So, what are your thoughts? What are the kind of theological conversations you've gotten into or never? <laughs> what are the ways you've wrestled with it? What are your questions about what other people are doing, other congregations? I love Q&A. So no question, I, I wanted to say no question is ever stupid in my mind. Yes. We looked into uh, solar. It came up briefly in one of our initial discussions uh, when we were brainstorming. And we found out from uh, the Episcopal Church down the street, they did it. They put solar on their roofs. But uh, they had to take them down, and um, uh, uh, maintenance 
problems. Uh, it was the amount of energy saved was minuscule relative to the investment. Um, they said, get involved in a cooperative. They recommended, this is related to one of your points there, that a solar farm that has the ideal slope and you know, uh, less uh, trouble of cleaning off the snow on the roof. You know, and um, and that was that was uh, insightful. You know, to check around with the local uh, organization that had done something, and they and they recommended something better. So the other thing I say though is don't always base your decisions on what someone else. Going back to solar panels, my daughter is a solar engineer. They are so much more efficient with less light. They constantly are building the panels to be able to take advantage of light at a lower angle. So it doesn't have to be as fine. Now it's interesting the maintenance. I've had solar in my house since 2002 was the first set. We now produce more electricity than we consume. But it made sense for us to replace those first panels because they were so much more efficient mm. later. They now build them on racks so that you don't have to replace your roof. But right now, folks, the, the incentives coming out of the federal government in New Jersey make it worth looking at a lot of things. Mm. But the other thing to do is what are your biggest sources of energy consumption? Mm. They're probably heating. Yeah. And cooling. So what we did was we looked and we put in a geothermal heat pump. Mm. So that's why we now produce far more electricity than we use because that's a far more efficient heating and cooling system. For your home? For our home. Wow. Um, but the other thing people can do is when you go to replace things, and I, I mentioned my husband is an engineer and he's the head of our town's environmental commission. I live in Maine Boy. Um, is they're now, um, I think they're called splits. And if you've ever been in a hotel that has those units up high that are actually really quiet, those are what many buildings are going to now. They're far more efficient. And then you just heat and cool the areas you're really using. So that's why I'm saying it's hard to keep up with all the changes, but people are constantly working on making it easier. So if I were to tell people about solar based on my first set, I wouldn't be giving them the full picture because, and I already know our last set is maybe five years old. And what my daughter tells me is they're even more efficient. And, you know, they're working really to work with um, roofs at many different angles. Mm -hmm. um, so that is to say, still, not everyone can do solar. But there are lots of other ways. And one way is exactly to support solar farms, to support the development of renewable energy. And I think you'll see from some of the things I say on here is I'm going to assume we're in Basking Ridge, then many of you have enough disposable income that you make donations to other groups. If you can support land restoration projects, water access in places. In other words, if we can use some of our <laughs> to help, I have a lot of students from Africa now, and the stories they tell me just They cut down every tree to try and have firewood to sell. The trees are gone, desertification, they can't grow crops anymore. The rivers dry up. Someone comes in and plants trees, but what we're reading now is that unless those trees are well suited for the changed climate that exists mm -hmm. and their water, they aren't going to last for them. So looking for those kind of projects that help people make a difference where they are, but also here in New Jersey, supporting keeping more land from being developed keeping wildlife areas large and growing. All of those are kind of things you can do. So you can see how that's your individual action collectively making a difference. Let's see what's on the next one. 
Yeah, the moon's solar. So the other thing is, um, I was thinking driving up here is a place a lot of churches get started is either in promoting gardens or pollinator gardens. Because what we know is that we're having a range of our pollinator species. And part of that is the spraying of pesticides. Huge use. So I don't know about your town. A couple of years ago, the mosquito sprayers invaded. And every yard suddenly <laughs> popped up with eye spray for mosquitoes. Well, it isn't that effective because it immediately blows. So my day for spraying, all it has done is kill a lot of the bees that I use for my garden. Mm -hmm. So that's another place that people work on a local level. There are many developments where you can't have a garden or you can't grow a garden in your front yard, which might be where the more sun is. I'm amazed at how many municipalities in New Jersey forbid you from growing your own food in your front yard. Our grandparents certainly did. That was a victory garden. Um, so maybe that wasn't your grandparents. Maybe it's a little more recent, your parents. <laughs> what other things have you all thought about or questions you wonder about? Yes. I, I have a hard time understanding the position of evangelical Christians who think that um, this is all a plot, you know, for, of the liberals, and um, and I don't know how to speak to them. I, I have a, a a nephew who has become, uh, you know, an evangelical Christian, and there's such a wide gap between. The way he thinks about things and the way I think about things, it's really hard to have a conversation um, without without sounding very judgmental and unloving. Um, so that's quite a problem. I mean, it's in many ways, it's the difficulty in understanding what the, how they could possibly be thinking this way. Well, the first thing I'm going to say, if you notice, I quoted the event no environment. So the first thing I always say is don't lump all evangelicals together. Catherine Hagel is an evangelical. She is working really hard to get people to care. Most black Protestants would fit the theological profile of an evangelical, high degree of biblical literalism, focused on salvation, belief in the end times, we know that they are more likely to care about climate change and hear something in church than any white Christian. That's what the surveys tell us. So that's the first thing is to sort of say, you know, there's a lot of different views within evangelicals. And then I often sort of say, you know, I was reading these biblical passages and this is what struck me. You know, and so find the common ground to talk instead of sort of, I know more than you do. So that was why I was trying to give you biblical passages to work with. And I find that one about all of creation sings praises to God. It's in our hymns, it's all over the place. It's in the, um, oh, I'm so bad at my terms. Oh, well, it's in one of the, the refrains that most of us sing. Oh, I have sure. a follow-on question, mm -hmm. slightly different. Um, when when you talk about not you, but when <laughs> one talks <laughs> about um, uh, you know uh, trying to replace fossil fuels with renewable sources of energy, those renewable sources of energy are inevitably more expensive. I mean, I got a, a, a solicitation from PSE and G. You know. You can or maybe it was from Green Mountain Power, I forget, but it was from one of my power companies saying you can choose to have all of your energy supplied from renewable sources. It's going to cost you more. Well, maybe I can afford that, but the argument is made that these these movements are going to be hard on people who are barely making it, right? If I can't afford to buy an EV car. And I'm running an old junker and it's polluting like crazy, and you make that illegal or you make that very expensive, that's going to hurt. Right. Me. We're going to take away guns and cars and everything. Well, um, no, no, I'm just saying, I'm talking about so what I can afford it. 
Right, but I'm trying to say that argument gets used to say you shouldn't support it. And what we know is that everything, the more it's produced, it comes down in cost. Solar in many places is cheaper than coal produced electricity. And there are far more renewable energy jobs coming on the market than there are for oil or gas. Yeah. So sometimes the argument goes, well, if we do all these things and we're taking away jobs, well, there's a classic one. Renewable energy is one of the biggest creators of jobs right now in the country. Right, but for the coal miner in West Virginia, that's not going to help him. You know what? There are plenty of people. My stepmother is from Pottsville, Kentucky. I lived in coal country. Most of those coal mining jobs already went away with automated machinery. So why is the why is the senator from West Virginia being such a blanket? Because he gets money from the coal folks. <laughs> so what's happened in 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 West Virginia is that miners petitioned to have all of those cleared mountaintops. They petitioned to have um, wind turbines, and the legislature forbid it. Uh, yes. So we always have to be suspicious. So that's what I was going to say. The argument often goes, well, actually, we are the ones that care the most for the poor, because if we have a thriving economy, it's going to trickle down. Or don't do something, because not everybody can the, the work on solar cooperatives is making it affordable in a lot of places because it will bring the price down. New York City replaced all of the refrigerators in their public housing. This was maybe 10 years ago because they use 75% less energy. So that's another place of important work, working with people to take advantage of the programs that help you reduce your energy. So, so why I bristled there a little bit is the amount of arguments I hear that say you should do something <laughs> that might make a technology become more affordable. Electric cars are coming down in price because they're producing more of them and more people are buying them. So that's called an early, being an early adopter. Early adopters, that's why we went. We went for solar in 2003 because our son had asthma. And we said, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. And so what I want you to think about is the cost. If the cost becomes an issue for you, multiply how many pizzas you would have to save. It's a great New Jersey sort of <laughs> economic <laughs> denominator. <laughs> because when you look at it, that difference in the energy bill is often the cost of maybe now just one pizza. They've gone up so much. <laughs> but think of it in those terms. If what I'm doing has this multiplier effect on so many more people breathing the clean air, isn't it worth my giving up Going out the windows. So that's what I'm asking you to put those economic decisions, not just in dollars, because that's on problem. But think about them in terms of values. And that's what we recognize. If we didn't adopt solar early, how can we talk to other people about how damaging air pollution was to the lungs of young children? Because I was appalled at what asthma meant for our son. We live in Maple. We live right next to Newark. We have tons of highways all around us. Little did we know. Does that help in thinking about it, Tom? Yes, definitely. So please try those out on me because I get a lot of these questions. <laughs> yes. I'm hoping that in five or no more than 10 years, we can eliminate plastic bottles. All plastic disposable. Well, what do you yeah. think? Is that possible? Or do you think we are with that one? A long way to go, right? Yeah, I wish we lived in one of those states that uh, had deposits because that's a huge way to change consumption. Um, the way it's probably going to say is we've got to quit buying them, you know? And I'm going to say something here that might 
um, ruffle a few feathers. I certainly tell my students I don't want to see a disposable drink bottle in my classroom. Then we're going to practice what I'm teaching, what they're learning. Some of the biggest users are our sports teams. Work with them, but if you have a limited amount of energy, reducing plastic may not be the best use of your time. And that's, I know, hard to hear. Yes, plastic bottles, not only are they made of petroleum, but if you think about it, a pint's a pound the world around, and we're paying to transport water, often from Michigan and California across the country. So that adds to it. So I am a firm believer in reducing them. But at the same time, I know it might make a bigger difference if you work on some of the things that municipalities do. Or, as you see, I immediately multiplied it up, how to get sports teams to use less. Because when my daughter was in sports, I would see 100 bottles just like that. I didn't consume 100 bottles all year, probably. So helping them not to do that was, and helping them in a positive way so instead of banning it. So that's the thing we're learning. It's just like you were already hearing Banning things makes people think that their rights and freedoms have been restricted. Now that's a hard one because actually not doing anything is more, far more restricting our freedom and rights. As I like to say, isn't it a basic freedom to be able to breathe clean air? My ability to breathe clean air is constantly restricted by the activities of governments and others and health legislators. So that's one way I'm trying to think. People that want to talk about rights and responsibilities and freedoms is to say we're never clear of that. This is the other way I'm trying to get people to think sometimes. So imagine the nice green on the square in town. I think there's some kind of a square in town, isn't there? Well, yeah, it's yeah, this. Right 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> think of the place where people cut across. Right, so they cut across instead of following the paths. <laughs> now, the first person who cuts across doesn't have any effect. The tenth person doesn't have that much effect. But by the time all of us say walked across that grass, say three times, the grass is dead. Who killed the grass? Did the last person kill the grass? Did the first person? We all bear collective responsibility. And so when we only think in terms of individual responsibility and rights, we miss that big picture of the added collective behavior. So I am optimistic. We are doing better on plastic bags. I mean, California has been doing plastic bags for years. Europe, if you want to learn what people can deal with, just go to Europe, go to Korea. If you want to learn recycling, those folks know how to recycle things right and left because they're basically an island. They don't anywhere for their garbage to go. So when you hear people say, oh, well, we can't, we can't recycle, we can't do it that detailed or something, there are plenty of other examples. Um, New York City just passed a law that said um, take out food, you have to request that you get the plastic utensils and everything. That alone could make a huge difference. So what I would say is go to your local businesses. Think about what they're producing in terms of what they hand you every time, what they serve on. My favorite bagel place went from using plates to using all styrofoam. It's like, come on, folks, start the phone. That was 30 years ago. <laughs> um, so that's another place to work on it. So if you want to say, how do we get there? Part of it is not just our own individual behaviors, but looking for the places that consume the most and getting the positive laws passed. Mm -hmm. Lobbying, lobbying is our worst enemy from these things. So if your elected officials aren't hearing from you about it, they're gonna hear mm -hmm. from the producers of those plastic items mm -hmm. far more. So we have time for one more question. Yeah. Okay. 
what are your thoughts about prioritizing what where can we get the most bang from the buck? You talked about maybe plastic bottles aren't what we should be how does one create a list that we're either individually or collectively? Well, scenarios. first of all, is just what Catherine Hamill was saying, where are your strengths? Where can you talk to people? There are so many places to start. And that's what I beg of you. Don't get in arguments with each other over where's the most important place to start. Go with what you have a passion for. But what I was trying to say about the kind of decisions that our school systems are making, our municipalities are making, our various levels of government, they are huge because if we keep making decisions that lock in our dependence, on fossil fuels, then they're going to keep wanting to build pipelines. And if they build the pipelines, then they're going to say, oh, well, you can't do anything that affects my market. So thinking ahead in those terms, what does a society look like that isn't so dependent on fossil fuels? Is a, a key place. And, and that's why. The kind of, I mean, now that my husband is chair of an environmental commission for town, the kind of little decisions that towns make, and I'll just put it up front for you. Quite artificial turf. That is so much more plastic than plastic bottles. <laughs> it gets replaced every eight to 10 years. It is tons and tons of plastic. It doesn't get recycled, but it does go into the water. So there's a place you might not think of. You want to work on plastic? Stop all of the plastic being put in. It's our it's our open trust space, uh, open space funds that are often used to put in those fields. That's what we discovered in our town. They weren't using those open space trust funds. They were using them to put plastic and replace grass. So that's the kind of thing you start paying attention to the decisions that are being made. That decisions being made by the recreation folks in town. We twice now defeated it in Maplewood. We are pretty rare in the state. But it's exactly that. And sure enough, the field they put it in the school system, it didn't even last eight years, hundreds of thousands of years. I just keep thinking what that would have done for improving education. Mm -hmm. You know. So one last, I am, that was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to talk to people afterwards. Yes. Um, they, some of the things that are made out of plastic are being made out of recycled plastic. Though. And if you fight those, now there's no market for recycling the plastic. How do you address that issue? I wish <laughs> there was going to be no market. <laughs> <laughs> I, I encourage those immensely. It's, there's going to be a lot of things that it does make sense to use plastic for. A lot of that recycled plastic goes into boardwalk and benches that then last a lot longer, particularly on the shore. So we are not going to get rid of all the uses of plastic. It is the foundation of way too much of our economy in our lives. There's lots of places that we can move. But you can see why I say don't pour all of your energies into just that one because it's enormous. So here's two things to leave you with. One thing is I say the good thing about any individual practices is they make you mindful. So when I ask my students, pay attention to how much meat you drink. We do know that meat eating makes a big difference. I said, I'm not asking you to give up meat. I'm saying, do you need it three times a day? Could you have a meatless Monday? So individual practices make us mindful of our consumption and our behavior. And that can be a form of spiritual practice. But my other plea to you is root your work in your spirituality, in the places that give you love and joy and happiness. I have to constantly choose to see the glass half full when I know all too well how empty it is. And I break down in tears with my students sometimes. But bringing them into despair is not going to get them anywhere. So work on the whatever motivates you to love God's creation. Share that joy with others. 
make other people care that when a bird doesn't sing, member of God's choir is present. So do what you can, but don't burn yourself out. Mm -hmm. And remember, our young people, they have grown up with these headlines. They have grown up with the headlines of huge forest fires, storms that never have happened before, floods that have never happened before. We have got to help them because all too many of them have gone straight to despair. And despair is not a place to act. So share some joy. We know younger generations are getting outside far more than the generations before. Help them do that. Help them find God in creation so that they too have a sense of joy. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Laurel, for, for giving us some new ways to frame this question, to think about it, to not despair. Yes. <laughs> um, so before you go, a uh, little bit of homework for you. And, uh, just remember that in most of our lifetimes, nice. the Cuyahoga River in Ohio and Cleveland was burning. I grew up there. I descended to the peak so that it's finally been cleaned up. Right, so don't despair, do something. Pittsburgh, my cousins tell me the snow would turn black within two minutes. There was so much to be here. People did Always. The Lake Erie Virgin. Yes. There were so many hopeful stories. Share those hopeful stories with people so they know that you can make a difference. And one individual often is the driving force behind the start of success. Um, I'm going to give you another word. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm good on that. You have the the bell on all the time. I'm saying, I'll say, do you have something to say what she says? The problem is, when you're the professor and you're trying to fix it, and you're going to Yeah. So your homework um, is sort of following up on the discussion today and preparing for some of the sessions that follow is to look at your own environmental footprint. So um, I'm trying to get it larger so you can see it. And I will email this out to everybody so you can see it, but it's footprintcalculator.org. And it's a very simple a uh, tool you just go through maybe six or eight screens it asks you questions like that you know how often do you eat animal or plant-based proteins and it will give you a uh, uh, a score of your environmental footprint and um, maybe some uh, a place to start in thinking about your own individual impacts where you can start making a difference whether it's in recycling or food choices or and other consumer choices. So this will be um, a segue into our next sessions, which uh, the, the next session will actually be about living simply and justly. And we'll be um, talking about ideas of, uh, you know, how all the waste that we create ourselves and what uh, the result of that is. So, um, and that is scheduled, what, what day did we say? March 19th. March 19th, and we'll be getting some more information out about that soon. So thank I just you. want to say language makes a difference. Notice she said animal-based proteins. That gets people to think, oh, us cheese eaters, okay. it's the same animal. So it's a, exactly a way to sort of say, no, I'm not targeting meat eaters. Right. I'm thinking about what are the sources of our protein? How do they relate and to what animals? Because some cheeses come from goats, which is a different impact factor. So language makes a difference. Think about how it's heard by others. Yeah. Yeah. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Yeah, everyone should come back in March and say, I've talked to five people about what we're doing. Exactly. Yes, we'll be checking. I will be here. I will be here. Check. She will. <laughs> thank you again, Laurel. My pleasure.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.